Well, hello, 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 hello. Welcome to series two, episode four of The Grab Bag. I feel like now there should be some introductory music. Oh, well, just me. I don't really need music, I guess. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you made yourself available. And I hope this lesson will be encouraging to you. Just remember, we mentioned before that if I make a mistake, I make a mistake. And we just go on. I, uh, it's good for you to know, I guess, huh? That preachers even make mistakes, that preachers mess up, that preachers need grace, especially from the people who are listening to them. So please uh, be patient there. <laughs> I told Joy, I was going to tell everybody, you may get a joy sighting <laughs> sometime through this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's my photo bomb wife. So uh, it's 81 degrees today. It is October 22nd. Uh, even though you aren't going to see this till I, I don't know exactly when. Uh, but you're experiencing the same weather as we are. It's a warm Indian summer kind of day. And you're probably doing a little bit of what I did today. Or maybe you've already done all your work, putting away all of the patio furniture, kind of nipping, tucking everything up, getting ready for the winter that's coming on. But I don't want to put everything away. I, there's still, you know, you need to sit outside and enjoy some of this stuff. So uh, at least it's on the way and you're probably doing the same thing. Enjoy's out watering her flares. She's got mums because mums the word these days. Two sessions ago, I ended up by saying that the next session would be kind of like linked up by the idea that in that session we were talking about the body as a tent. And, oh, great. <laughs> oh, great. There. I should have silenced my phone. This is as embarrassing as being in church when it happens. So what else can happen? Yeah. So we were talking about to body, as Peter described it, as being a tent. Paul described it as being a tent. You know, just a temporary structure. And one day it will be done with. And we, of course, as Christians, will find ourselves in a place that not built with human hands and we'll go home to the place that we've never been before. And then I was going to talk the next session, which you've been in this one about Paul's verse in first Corinthians, where he says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy spirit. So in one, our body is a tent, a temporary structure. In the other one, our body is the temple of the Holy spirit. Uh, but I inserted an amplification of the sermon that I'm going to preach actually this Sunday, but you won't hear about this lesson on it until after Terry preaches a week from this Sunday. You got all that? Mark that on your calendar. So anyway, and who really cares, right? So let's just go on. Uh, we're going to talk about this lesson and use uh, cite Paul's verse in 1 Corinthians uh, 6 19 and where Paul says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit but before that I think it's very important that we get not just the context of the chapter in which that verse was written but that we also get a context of the culture or the city in which the Corinthian church was located I won't give you a whole lot of information, but I'm using a commentary because I don't know all of this information. But the commentary gentleman, uh, Leon Morris, gives us this information, that the city of Corinth acquired an equally unsavory reputation. To Corinthianize was popular Greek for go to the devil. Because Corinth was a very cosmopolitan place. 
and the ideal of the Corinthian was the reckless development of the individual. You know, it's all about me. The merchant who made his gain by all and every means, the man of pleasure surrendering himself to every lust, the athlete steeled to every bodily exercise and proud in his physical strength are the true Corinthian types. In a word, the man who recognized no superior and no law but his own desires. Corinth was a prestigious center from which the gospel could radiate to the surrounding districts. Anything preached in Corinth would be sure of a wide dissemination. So he tells us that Corinth is cosmopolitan. You know, it, it was the capital of Acacia, I believe. Um, and anyway, it was a for those times a very modern city a heavy population, but it was also very decadent and very secular in the way that they thought. They, it was all about making money no matter the cost. It was all about how I look and well, pretty much like you might think America is today. But then he tells us that Paul was using this for his advantage because he says Corinth was a center from which the gospel could uh, radiate out to the surrounding districts. You see, Corinth was a, uh, a very heavily used port and uh, merchant area. It was uh, very much involved in the trade back then. And so merchants would come in and people would come in for temporary amount of time and then they would leave. And so Paul saw that as a great strategy. Let's make Christians in Corinth Let's make Christians of people who come here even for temporary amounts of time. And then when they leave, they can take the gospel with them. And that is exactly what happened. Now, in the church in Corinth, they had problems. There were divisions within. Morris here says that they had a quarrelsome spirit. They had problems with sexual immorality. They had numerous problems um, inside the church because sin, the sin of the, of the world, the sin of the city had infected the church. You know, sometimes the greatest struggle of church leaders is not to keep the church out of sin, but rather to keep sin out of the church. Because the enemy within the walls is as dangerous as the enemy without. I mean, you, you think about the fact that these are people who are coming out of a pagan society. They're at different levels in their spiritual relationship. They have different motivations, different drives, different temptations, different desires. And they come into the church. And you can't stand at the door and say, we got to check you on this and this and this and this and this and make sure you're squeaky Jesus clean before you can come in. I mean, even now, you know, we have people come in to worship at the church and we're not aware of all the sin that's going on in their lives. And they bring some of those attitudes and some of that sin into the church and they can Indeed, it's happened where people have come into the church with their sin and they've led people in the church away from the Lord. So Corinth was a typical church in a cosmopolitan area that was struggling with having unity within. And they were struggling with allowing some pretty obvious uh, sinful habits to occur within the fellowship. So sin had infiltrated like the COVID virus and it was wreaking damage. In 1 Corinthians chapter six, beginning verse eight, Paul writes, instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. Okay, so, you know, they're hurting each other. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And then Paul gets a list. 
neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he's not addressing people who fall into temptation or fall into sin because they're tempted, you know, and they, and they mess up and, but they come back. He's talking about people who think this is okay. And this is an okay lifestyle to have. And it's okay to be, to say you're a Christian and be in the church and still purposely live in this way. Old sinful ways don't die easily. Sinful people bring their sinful struggles into the church, and the battles are not easily won. Paul reminds the Corinthians of who they are in Christ, and he reminds them of the commitments that they made. In verse 11, he says, this is what some of you were. <laughs> you know, he's, he's kind of saying to you, look, you're different. That's what you were. Past tense. Uh, inferred is the idea, stop living like that. Don't do that anymore. That's who you were. He says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You were sanctified. You were set apart and made holy. You were justified. You were treated just as if you'd never sinned because of your relationship with Jesus. So in this context of reminding and rebuking and teaching, Paul writes these words, beginning in verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Run, baby, run! You know, sexual immorality is such a strong temptation, especially for those who had freely indulged for so many years. And now all of a sudden, to, to quell that urge and that drive is very difficult. And Paul is saying, don't, don't stand there and fight it. Just run. Flee sexual morality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, without whom you have received, or I'm sorry, there's no without, who, the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You know, I think Paul may be taking his cue from Jesus in using the body as a metaphor for the temple. Immediately following the cleansing of the temple, John records this in chapter 2. The Jews said to him, what sign... Can you show us to prove your authority to do this? In other words, overturn the tables, whip people. You know, what, 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 who gives you the authority to do this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body, is what John writes in verse 21. And John didn't even understand that when Jesus spoke it, because the next verse he says, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. In retrospect, like I said, the disciples, according to verse 22, after the resurrection, realized that Jesus was referring to his body 
as a shrine or as a temple? What were they thinking at the moment when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days? Well, they were probably just as skeptical as the Jews who were asking Jesus the question. Jesus and the troublemakers, you see, were speaking the same language, using the same terms, but with different meanings. They meant the physical temple uh, in which Jesus overturned the tables, but Jesus was referring to his body in reference to his resurrection. The disciples would get that in retrospect. So both Jesus and Paul use an equivalent Greek word here, naos, naos, which is translated as temple or shrine. So Jesus said, you destroy this temple, this naos, and I will raise it again in three days. And they said, it has taken 46 years to build this naos, and you're going to raise it in three days. But the naos, that Jesus had spoken of was his body. They're using the same terminology, but with different meanings. This is one of those cases where it's like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You gotta search out the meaning and you gotta ponder and meditate on what Jesus is saying. So the word nows, specifically means a dwelling place for a divine being. A dwelling place for a divine being. And so I'm sure you can see how this metaphor connects. When Paul says, your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. Who indwells the shrine of a believer's body? Well, the Holy Spirit who, according to Paul, is in you, whom you have received from God. And so the body, or the naos of the believer, is a naos, a shrine or a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And so, again, I'll repeat, that's what Paul writes. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? After Paul makes that statement, he delivers a powerful statement of realization to build onto his foundational teaching about a Christian's body. What does this miracle of the indwelling Holy Spirit mean in a practical discipleship lifestyle? Uh, and so maybe I was, what I meant by when I said he, he delivers a powerful statement is that he says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. But then he doesn't stop there. He adds, like I said, a very powerful statement. Uh, I said a statement of realization for people to to what I meant by that was it's a statement for people to realize just how important this truth is. And he says to follow up, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. So what does the miracle of the indwelling Holy Spirit mean in a practical discipleship lifestyle? What it means is that you don't own you. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Ouch. Can you say ouch? Because like modern Americans, the Greeks and the Romans worshiped bodily strength, power, muscle, beauty. You know, their gods were always depicted like our superheroes. And the goddesses like Venus were divinely beautiful. 
Just think of Narcissus, who was captivated by himself as he gazed into the mirrored pool. These ancients were masters of their own bodies. They could do with their bodies as they chose. That was their thinking. And now Paul is saying to the Corinthian Christians, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something else. You are not your own. So now there's this new voice that's to be heard with contradictory teaching from what they grew up thinking. You're, you know, they, they grew up thinking you're the master of your own fate. You're the captain of your own ship. You know, get, get ahead, be on top, be the top dog, no matter what it costs. Even with the little information I told you about the Corinthians and their society, how do you think that message would have been received back then? How, how do you think they would have felt after reading Paul saying, you're not your own? Meaning, of course, you're not in charge of your own self. You're not you in a bag of chips. How do you think they're going to receive that message? Well, how do you think it's received in today's society? Where who I am and what I do is my body. And it's none of your concern, thank you very much. And so if I want to make my body into a pharmacy and pump it full of drugs, that's my choice. If I want my body to be a smokestack in a tobacco factory, who are you to say anything about it? If I want to turn my body into a distillery or a brewery, just keep your mouth shut, your opinion to yourself. If I want to use my body and make my body into a brothel, hey, just mind your own business. If it feels good, I do it. If I want to turn my body into a round-the-clock money-making machine and work, 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 work to achieve, 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 that's none of your business. See, I can do anything I want because this is my body. I own it. I have a right to an abortion because it's my body. And the life within me has no rights above my own. After all, I own this body, and he or she inside of me is only a temporary residence. Sex is natural and normal. After all, we are in our base nature nothing but animals. And so when the urges strike, let out the animal inside. Shake off those puritanistic rules of centuries ago. We are evolved. We are modern people and so much more intelligent. I am my own, and who are you to tell me differently? Well, that to me, is a lot of the way, and, and you, may, you can disagree with me, that's just my evaluation of the way that non-Christian Americans think. So imagine taking somebody who like that, and they become a Christian, and you move them into the church. They don't change all of their thinking and all their habits absolutely immediately. They may not check every Christian religious box on your list, to be the kind of person you think, but then you and I don't check every box on somebody else's and definitely not every box on God's list of what he wants us to be. The concern for me, friends, is for people who know Christ, who have grown in Christ, and who know what the scripture says 
and yet in rebellion and deliberately, I guess you might say, thumbing their noses at God. They just say, I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> it's God's job to forgive me, so I'll do whatever I want to do. And that's the kind of behavior, that's the kind of thinking that leads to poor behavior that Paul was combating, that Paul was wanting to change. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit living in you. You are not your own. You have been bought at a price. See, Paul is coming down strongly and is probably not popular with everyone. But then he pounds another hammer when he says, here is why you are not your own. Like I said, you have been bought at a price. Well, who bought them? And who took over the ownership? We read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. I'm trying to follow my notes here and look at six times. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Now, you know the word redeemed simply means to buy back. You know, uh, when I was growing up, we had S and H green stamps, you know, and you could take them and you could redeem them for a gift. You could trade them in and get something for it. Uh, coupons are somewhat the same. You can give a coupon and you get a monetary um, benefit back from it. The whole idea of redeem is to give something and to, to buy something back, to give something of value and to buy something back. That's what God was doing in Christ, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf in order that we might become the righteousness of God. God, in a sense, traded Jesus in so that you and I could be bought back. And I hope that isn't, doesn't sound too elementary or sacrilegious, but I'm just, I hope that maybe it helps to understand if somebody wonders, what does the word redeem mean? So Paul, or Peter writes, it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. And, you know, it wasn't silver and gold that bought you back. You were redeemed. You were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So you and I, every Christian, including the Corinthians, was bought back at the cost of divine blood. So if you pay for a ring... You don't tell people, or don't you tell people, that's my ring? I mean, if you get a new car, don't you tell people, yeah, that's my car? It's not your neighbor's. It's not even your BFF's ring or car. It's yours. You bought and paid for it. Well, we are owned by the one who paid the price for us. We were on the auction block and already sold as slaves to Satan and sin with a dark eternal end awaiting us. But God redeemed us. He bought us back, set us free to eternal life. <laughs> he brought us out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light. That's what Paul tells us in the Colossian letter. We have been redeemed. We are not our own. We have been bought. We were purchased with a price. You can hear the helicopters. <laughs> Joy's out there laughing. She, she knows. Okay. Okay. So, when a homeowner purchases a house, 
the homeowner doesn't just buy a room in the house. He gets everything, including the property around the house. Well, in the same way, when Jesus was offered as payment for you, God didn't purchase just a room for you to set up a religious theme or a religious niche for holidays and Sundays. God purchased not just your souls, God purchased body and soul, mind and heart, lock, stock, and barrel. You are not your own. You have been totally bought at a price. In fact, all of your possessions and property, technically speaking, are now God-owned. You are just a steward of them. They belong to God. You see, we lost everything in order to find and to gain everything. So when God bought your house, that I'm talking about your body, your temple, he purified you and he made you holy. And then he moved in, in the person of the Holy Spirit. Old things have gone, new things have come. He owns our temples, tents, tabernacles, and he lives in us. So after pounding home these spiritual truths about our bodies being temples, about not being our own, about being bought at a price, Paul slams one final hammer and delivers the practical life lesson blow. He says, therefore, honor God with your bodies. The word could probably, more accurately, I think, be translated glorify God, because the word is doxos, which is the Greek word for glory. And Paul is saying, glorify God with your body. What does it look like to glorify God with your body? How do you pay homage to? How do you worship? How do you serve God with your body? You see, it's not just about your mind and your heart, but it's also about with your body. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Strength is, is, represents the body, I believe. We trust God spiritually, physically and to honor God with all that we are. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, present your bodies, um, I, oh, I keep thinking it's sozo, in a, which is translated flesh, but I, I think it's that Greek word, but you know, I'm, I could be wrong on that. You Greek scholars, look it up and check me. Um, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Giving your bodies to the service of God is the most reasonable and wisest decision, considering the blood price that was paid for you. you know, go back, if we look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 ends with this awesome description of the power, the majesty of God. Paul says, there, um, let's see. Oh. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What a benediction. And then he starts what we call chapter 12 with saying, therefore. In other words, since this is true, since God is so awesome and so powerful, in, uh, from him and through him and to him are all things, since this is true, 
Therefore, in view of God's mercy, <laughs> this mighty God has been merciful to us. And in view of his great mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. He doesn't say offer your minds. He doesn't say offer your spirits. It's interesting. He says offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God, holy and acceptable. In other words, it's not just your mind and your spirit, but God owns your body. And so when a Christian says, I can do whatever I want with my body because it's my body, then they don't understand the depth of redemption. That we were bought back, body and soul. That God owns everything. And we are to give God not just our hearts and our minds, but we are to also give God our bodies as instruments of righteousness, holy and acceptable to God. So, I quit following my notes and just got the preaching there. So, that's what Paul is saying. When you see who God is, the most logical, rational thing is to present your body, everything you have, to be used to glorify God. You are not your own. You have been bought by the price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Why would you not vow to serve so loving and great a father in such a practical way by giving him everything, everything? I'm going to take a little rabbit trail here, but I think you'll see how this fits in. Uh, in the first century, there was a heresy that was kind of like... Uh, Uh, it was like new age philosophy. If that was, that's kind of a dated term too from back in the eighties and nineties, but um, there was a philosophy called Gnosticism. And I wish I had a whiteboard behind me because I tell you, Gnosticism is spelled G N O S T I C I S M. It begins with G. The G is silent. It's Gnosticism. It was false teaching. It was a mixture of Oriental mysticism and Greek philosophy and even some Christian thought. Now, the Greek word for knowing or knowledge is the word gnosko. Gnosko. So if you were to take Gnosticism and pronounce the G, you would have gnosticism. So it was basically taken from the Greek word gnosko, which means to know or to understand completely. Are you following with me? Gnosko, to know or to understand completely. Now the Gnostics, the followers of Gnosticism, believed that there was a special divine knowledge that one could get to know God. If only you could achieve a higher spiritual plane of devotion through a supernatural experience apart from this material world. And there are a lot of people who still believe that today, you know, that they'll go out in the desert or, or climb the top of a pole and sit, or they're gonna find a cave somewhere. And they're just going to say, well, I want nothing to do with this material world because I'm in search of this higher spiritual devotion. And, and some of that is noble. Um, you know, we need to get rid of the things that so easily entangle us. And if they're tripping us up, then we need to leave them behind in order to grow spiritually stronger. But the Gnostics believed what is called, oh, by the way, you ever hear the word agnostic, right? So if you take agnostic, 
if you were to take the A and then have Gnostic, the G is silent. Gnosticism or Gnosko means to know. Well, an agnostic is one who believes that God's existence or non-existence cannot be known. So a Gnostic, <laughs> you know, is one who said, well, I, I, I want to leave this world behind and I want to uh, get to know God through this extrasensory spiritual revelation. Agnostics are those who say, you can't even get to know God. You don't know if he exists or doesn't exist, and you can't really know if he does or doesn't. And that's what agnostics believe even today. But the Gnostics believed in what's called a dual anthropology. And by that, they mean there is a separation or a gap between the material and the spiritual realms. The material world is evil, but the spiritual world is good. And the material, the body, I'm sorry, the body does not affect the spirit, nor does the spirit affect the body. Now, I, I don't have time to go into all of that in detail. Here's why I mentioned that. Because the practical outworking of Gnosticism was that flesh and spirit are separate and they're not connected. Now, if you think about that in terms of Jesus, what that brought about was the idea that then the incarnation is not valid. Because John says, the word, God, the word who was with God in the beginning, the word was God, is God, became flesh. And the Gnostics would say, no way. You can't have divinity and flesh together. Divine Jesus could not inhabit a fleshly body. Now, on the other end, they would say as well <clears throat> that the resurrection could not have happened because <clears throat> there is no way that a spirit, the spirit of God would come back, or Jesus would come back into a body. It wouldn't happen. But here's another outworking of that philosophy. They believed that there was no accountability then for sin that was committed in the body. There was no personal guilt. A man's body, a person's body is distinct from, uh, a spirit is distinct from his body, and his body is distinct from his spirit. What you do in the body does not affect you spiritually. What you do spiritually doesn't affect your body. So it's sin with no accountability. I know that might sound far at least it does to me. But the practical idea of it was that you're free to do with your body whatever you want to do. And so John's gospel and letters were written with the Gnostic teaching in mind. I already mentioned John chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In his letter, the epistle in 1 John chapter 1, listen to what John writes. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, See, John, of course, was an actual eyewitness of Jesus, and he's saying, you know, I, I touched him, I saw him, I heard him. And, you know, I, you could say, I smelled him. We walked around a lot. We sweat a lot. I, I mean, this was a real person, flesh and blood. He says, this we proclaim concerning the word of life, the word who was with God in the beginning, the word who is God. He says, the life appeared. We have seen it, and we testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father has appeared to us. And we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write this to make our joy complete. So John is simply saying, the flesh and the Spirit they were together in the person of Jesus. And here is what John wrote that has impact on this misbelief 
that sin committed in the body has no eternal repercussions. John wrote, this is a message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Now listen, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. In other words, if you say that you have fellowship with Jesus and yet you live a totally sinful life because you believe that what you do in your body does not affect your spirit, John says, you're lying and you don't live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, you know, if we practice what the light taught us, what he revealed, that's what light does, it reveals. If we practice what he revealed to us, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, you know, because it doesn't matter what I do, I still have this great relationship with God. John says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. On the other hand, if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge that, yes, my, my sin affects my spirit, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, then we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. See, the Gnostics would claim to be sin-free because their spirits would not be held accountable for what their flesh did. So why did I take this little rabbit trail? Why are these truths important today? Because I'm afraid that many 21st century Christians live like first century Gnostics. You know, we believe things like, it doesn't matter what kind, I mean, you know, if some superstar's death gets reported, you know, some rock and roll star or whatever, you know, well, they went to heaven. They, they could have been the biggest hellion, but yet they went to heaven. We know where they are. They're in a better place. And so you believe that everyone goes to heaven because the spirit is not accountable for what the body does. You know, as long as I maintain some sort of spiritual connection in some degree, at one point I went to, I went to church, at one point I, I was baptized, or, you know, um, I go to church on Easter and Christmas, and, well, then my physical sins won't affect me. My spiritual standing with God won't be affected, or my spiritual growth will not be inhibited or stunted. Those sins that I commit, they won't hinder me. I go to the gym with a guy, his name is Jim. And, you know, oh, I don't go to church. I take, I take my wife to church. I used to go to church. In fact, I used to be a, a deacon in the church, and, but I, I don't go anymore. But I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, and he cusses, and I, he's not the kind of guy, as far as I know, who goes out and sleeps around. He's talking today about the fact that he's married to his wife for 52 years, and his word was, I got a hell of a woman. <laughs> That's a great way to describe your wife. But to Jim, you know, he's okay. The sin that he commits has no effect. In John chapter 8, verse 31, well, in verse 32, that, that's the verse that is often quoted. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And there are a lot of people who are not even Christians who, who maintain that. You know, find out the truth, and the truth will set you free. Gain knowledge. Gain understanding, just like the Gnostics. Get to know, get to know, and it'll set you free. But it's Jesus who said it. And verse 32 
is left out there hanging to dry if you don't have verse 31 to give it a foundation because it's a conditional statement. Jesus said, if, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, the, the freeing truth of the gospel is truth that comes through a daily discipleship commitment to Jesus that involves our minds and our bodies being obedient, holding to his teaching. Because then you are really a disciple, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In a previous lesson, I talked about John chapter 13, where Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. And I even preached this in a, a sermon, I think, at the end, at the beginning of October, in which Jesus, after he did the foot washing, said, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now that you know these things, if you obey, that's when you are blessed. So, <laughs> that's why you, you may think, well, where are we going with this? Okay, well, I'm, I'm wanting to get across the idea, brothers and sisters, that we are not saved by the blood of Christ, the precious blood of Christ, redeemed by the blood of Christ. I think Satan does that on purpose when you're trying to make a point. <laughs> redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, not silver and gold, just to live the same way that we did before we were saved just to have the same attitudes, the same behaviors, the same lifestyles, the same drives, the same motivations. We, God bought all of us, our minds and our bodies, and all are to be brought subject and in submission to his will, for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And some of the behaviors that Christians carry out thinking, ah, no big deal. Those are behaviors that are not advocated, nor are they practiced in heaven. And so I'm not trying to frighten anybody, but at the same time, I do want to add strength and emphasis to a teaching that we need to be obedient. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. It's almost like defacing the temple, you know, with cans of spray paint when we mess with the body and do things with it that God would not say is holy behavior. Oh, the Holy Spirit is living within us. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul wrote, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins 
as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so, if someone would happen to watch this and say, no, Rob, it's hogwash. You're not rejecting me. You're rejecting God, who gave you his Holy Spirit. In Romans 6, Paul wrote, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and every, offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Offer yourself to God as someone who has been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself as an instrument of righteousness. So the fact is, Jesus did not die to redeem only our spirits. Jesus died to redeem us body and soul. He owns us. He owns you. Hear the words of Paul. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. You know, what's a hypocrite, right? A hypocrite is someone who talks one thing or believes, says he believes one thing, and then just, just the opposite. Quit being a first century Gnostic. Quit being a 21st century hypocrite. If you sin, confess your sin, and God will forgive you. But don't just go on living any way you want with your body, assuming that your spirit's just going to be okay, that somehow they're separated. There's a dichotomy between your body and your spirit, and what your body does doesn't affect you spiritually. Because just as the body affects you spiritually, what you do spiritually will also, should also, affect the way that you live. It should affect your body. Offer yourselves to God as instruments of righteousness. Okay? Okay. No much, not much else to say. Um, I hope that encourages you. Yes, I hope it challenges you. These are the thoughts that I pray God challenges me every day as well. You know, I live in a sinful body, and I, I struggle. And just like you, I have to practice spiritual disciplines and trust that God will forgive me for the sins that I commit, but also God will give me strength to uh, become more disciplined as his disciple, to know the truth that sets me free because I obey him and I live in obedience to his teaching. Let's walk that path together. Okay? Okay. Take care. See you in the next lesson. Don't forget to, uh, if there's a button below that you can push saying that you watched this or you attended, and then, then let us know. Okay? Take care. We'll see you Sunday.